So should you learn Qiskit or Circ first if you're looking at learning your first quantum computing programming library? Now, of course, this isn't the only quantum computing library out there or even language, but these two, Qiskit and Circ, are the ones I'm asked about the most. So in this video, I'm gonna go through and talk a little bit about the similarities, the differences, the pros and cons, and actually talk to you about how you can find resources and projects to do with each of these languages. Now I see you IBM and Google folks, you're watching this video and waiting to see which one I recommend to decide whether to hit the like or dislike button. Now everyone else, please remember to like this video so they can't downvote me too hard. So here's the honest truth. I can and I do use both of these languages depending on what I'm using it for. They really do have different strengths and weaknesses, so depending on where you are in your quantum computing journey, you may find one easier to use or better suited to what you need to do with it right now. So first, let's start with the similarities of Circ and Qiskit. They are both Python-based, and they do work with a universal gate-based quantum computing model. And because of these similarities, the basics and the syntax of these two languages are actually pretty similar. If you compare how you write quantum circuits and gates using Qiskit and Circ, it looks pretty similar. They use the same gate sets. But this is really the same way as learning how to program, right? So you need to learn the concepts first, so for example a for loop, but the syntax is a little different and varied whether you write it in Python, in Java, or in Go. You have to learn the concept of the for loop first, but in the end, the syntax, that's really the easy part. And both are open source, so you can actually fork it and contribute to it publicly and add features or fix bugs. The IBM platform actually has a drag and drop circuit builder that you can use, which is good if you don't have the strongest programming background yet. You can drop the gates in and see what happens. There's visualizations of the block sphere built into the platform. That makes it great for a true beginner. One major difference between these two is access to real quantum computing hardware. So Google right now does not provide access to their quantum computing hardware through CERC, but IBM does. They provide up to 15 qubit chips for public access for free. Now, should this stop you from using CERC? I mean, it's definitely cool to say you ran code on a real quantum computing chip, right? However, since public access is limited to up to 15 qubits, if you want to run an algorithm that uses more than 15 qubits, well, you're going to have to fall back to the simulator as well. So there's nothing that you can do on a quantum chip that you can't do on the simulator, is what I'm saying. And using a real quantum chip introduces noise and hardware limitations. Things you should definitely be aware of, but maybe you don't need to deal with those upfront as you're learning. I've personally run into these issues in real life with the connectedness, with the hardware, and sometimes I don't want to deal with it when I'm just trying to do something. And obviously if you're using a real quantum chip, you're put in a queue behind a line of people to actually be able to run your code. So I personally mostly use simulators and I don't find this a deal breaker. IBM's general simulator can go up to 32 qubits. They have more specific simulator types with more qubits, but you'll be using the general. Google simulators go up to 30 qubits on the high performance external simulators. They also mentioned that the simulator can do more, but the RAM doubles with each additional qubit added, so I'm not sure if the 30 is an actual hard limit. Another thing I want to cover is access to different packages and algorithms that have been pre-written for you. Now, to no one's surprise, one of the huge benefits of Circ is their work on TensorFlow Quantum. TensorFlow Quantum actually focuses on quantum data and hybrid classical quantum models. So it combines these traditional quantum computing algorithms from Circ and mashes them together with TensorFlow. Start with the overview, and then you can run the notebook tutorials straight in your browser without installing everything. And that's fantastic, because I feel like installing things is sometimes half of the work. The tutorials cover Hello Many Worlds, the traditional MNIST classification, and then moves into quantum convolutional neural networks. The quantum data tutorial is also really important because it builds you intuition of what models can succeed in the quantum world. And I want to really point out the conclusions drawn from these experiments. Number one, that it's very unlikely that the quantum models of today will beat classical machine learning on classical data. Number two, just because the data is hard to simulate classically does not necessarily mean that it's going to be hard for a classical model to learn it. And number three, that we have found datasets that are easy for quantum models to learn but difficult for classical models. Having taken classical machine learning and deep learning courses for months and then doing the same thing with TensorFlow in just a few dozen lines of code in just one evening for binary classifier, well, that feels like kind of the future. I can see this future where doing quantum machine learning with TensorFlow Quantum is just that easy. Once, of course, we get the hardware to the level that it needs to be. Now, Qiskit has a package called Aqua, where it has pre-built algorithms that you can use without having to deal with it at the gate level. Aqua stands for Algorithms for Quantum Applications, by the way. So it has some pre-built algorithms for chemistry, finance, optimization, and machine learning. You can check out the tutorials and the documentation because they provide a lot of code examples and projects that have been done with Qiskit. The optimization section covers problems like traveling salesmen. With the finance section, you can deep dive into pricing options, credit risk analysis, and portfolio optimization. You can also look at machine learning and chemistry applications. 
Now I do want to say here, and this probably is obvious, but running the algorithm does not mean you know the algorithm. If you're an engineer, you probably know the pain of having to learn how to actually write all the sort functions by yourself and then later on being told, oh, just call sort. Just running the algorithms won't necessarily teach you much, and you're locked into the parameters that they allow you to adjust. So building from scratch is a good learning experience. But remember, both Cirque and Qiskit are open source, so if it's missing a feature, maybe you can build it yourself. So just keep that in mind, that if your goal is to actually learn the quantum algorithms and how quantum computing works, maybe start with building it from scratch. Just my tip. Now let me cover some resources and documentation for helping you actually learn how to write these languages. So Qiskit has documentation and an online textbook. The textbook does have very good and concise introductory content. Once you get more into the algorithms, the language gets a little more academic, and I think that while it's short, it does go a little bit over the head of total beginners. Actually, by the way, if you've tried using this textbook as a total beginner, let me know down in the comments what you thought. There's also a great Slack community for interacting with other learners and the IBM staff. There's also this book that I can recommend by Robert Laredo, who is an IBM staff member. What I really enjoy about this book is that it's written for people without a quantum physics background before developers. So it'll take you on your quantum journey from beginner to intermediate to advanced and running these quantum algorithms. So I think this book is really good suited for newcomers to the field that want to work with Qiskit, and it'll take you on that journey from the theoretical, the mathematical, and the coding side. So it's really a little bit for everyone and you can check out the link in the description below. Now, let's talk about the resources that we have for learning CERC. The official documentation is over here, at the CERC and the TensorFlow websites. Now, I've mentioned this book in some other videos, but this book, Quantum Computing and Applied Approach by Jack Hadari, is a good resource for beginners wanting to work with CERC. The author of this book actually works at Google as part of the Quantum Computing Project. It's also a really good book for software engineers that want to get into the quantum computing field, with some programming experience, but less quantum physics experience. It introduces core quantum computing concepts and also the mathematical background for quantum computing, so it's a really nice self-contained resource. So now that you have a good idea on where to get the resource to actually learn about it, let's talk about some projects that you can do. So again, these quantum computing libraries are gate-based, which means while the syntax is a little different, you can actually use the same algorithms on the different hardware. That actually may be a good exercise. Maybe take a paper that's been implemented in Qiskit and actually translate it to CERC, or vice versa. Now, my first stop looking for projects and papers is always archive.org, where there's a repository of papers. Just search for each of these platforms and you'll find papers that use them. One example is the option pricing using quantum computers paper that uses the IBM Tokyo device. I like this paper a lot because they actually show you the circuit, and it also uses quantum amplitude estimation, which is really useful to a lot of problems. It can achieve a quadratic speedup for classical algorithms that use Monte Carlo simulation. Monte Carlo is used for seeing possible outcomes of an event especially when there's a lot of uncertainty. Another fun project that you can do on any of these devices is actually write a quantum game. Google has quantum chess and a website built for it, featuring none other than Stephen Hawking and Ant-Man. Games are a fantastic way to learn quantum technology and actually build an intuition for it. Check out this paper on quantum games here. It also talks a little bit about other quantum games that were created, and you can create a quantum game as well. And of course, I get this next question a lot. What about the quantum supremacy using a programmable superconducting processor paper? Well, it's done in 53 qubits, so unfortunately we don't have public access or even a simulator big enough to actually replicate this experiment. Another quick tip for finding papers and projects to maybe work on is actually go to Google Scholar and enter the names of the research scientists that work on these projects. You can see what papers they've published using their own hardware and pick from there. So yes, in the end, for a beginner, it doesn't really matter what language you pick to learn. However, you might need some specific features that will make your learning easier. So for example, if you're less strong in programming, maybe the drag and drop interface from IBM will be better for you. If you know you definitely want to do more machine learning, then maybe do CERC and TensorFlow Quantum. If you just want to run some circuits and maybe use some pre-built algorithms, well, you can use Qiskit and Aqua for a lot of different applications. Of course, these are not the only two options for quantum computing programming. These are just the two I get asked about the most. For me, because I have more experience with Python and because I use Go, which is not really object-oriented, so using q -sharp is a little more unfamiliar to me. But if you have that background with object-oriented and you like that, go for q -sharp. Personally, I've used Qiskit a lot, especially for teaching beginners, but I tend to use Circ for deeper implementations. Now, that's just my preference, and you may have a different one, and that's totally okay. So if you're just starting out with coding and quantum computing, my biggest recommendation is to learn Python first, and I have a video here with resources on learning that. But Circ and Qiskit, when you're learning them as a beginner, are actually pretty similar. And it's not going to be hard for you to switch from one to the other, so the work will not be wasted. 
So really, don't overanalyze, just pick one and get started. The key is learning the quantum concepts themselves, and the rest is just smart. And please don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more videos on quantum computing, coding, and tech.